be speaking particularly on the course, the course that was developed um, to engage in data science and um, and data about gender violence and feminicides in the U.S.-Mexico border from a humanistic lens using digital technologies to create responsible and ethical visualizations and the use of this kind of data that um, crosses borders um, physically and metaphorically. <clears throat> uh, the This course that was um, at one point titled Border Women and, and Border Women Literature and Feminist Cartographies was um, first taught for, was offered for in the College of Liberal and Fine Arts for the Spanish program, um, having some students from the English department. Later on, um, the course received um, a grant from Mozilla Foundation under the Responsible Computing Challenge. And this grant was supporting, uh, was together with several professors in different universities at the University of Washington, at Lehigh University, UCLA, um, to put together some, to redesign some courses that are at the intersection of teaching data science and humanities topics and um, looking for ways to teach humanities students how to use this data with digital tools and vice versa and how data science can engage in responsible and ethical ways to use data under different topics. In my case, this course was centered in border women, specifically on the US-Mexico border and um, targeting the issues of gender violence and feminicides, which um, covers a broad understanding of data from the humanities, from the social sciences, and the need to use technologies in ethical ways, specifically because of the ongoing situation of violence in these regions, but also because of the vulnerability of, of the families and, and the women affected under the situation. The, the, core, the grant supported um, for, for the redesign of this course and um, to hire a student to um, support the teaching of this course, creating tutorials and assistance to specifically in this case, humanities students. And um, the course as well as the data sets and the tutorials will be um, publicly available for anyone that would like to have access to this kind of data or who would like to teach this course or redesign this course. Um, that's one of the intentions that this grant is supporting um, as well as to like further the, the course, the development of this courses between data science and the humanities. I'm speaking um, this course, I'm speaking it, um, teaching it in a university that is a Hispanic serving institution that just became research, uh, a research institution and it's working in the development of a data science school, one of the first one that it's um, in a Hispanic serving institution in San Antonio, Texas, that it's also uh, a region that it's mostly populated by Hispanic and international um, students, which involves bringing multilingual approaches to, to pedagogy and the transborder aspect that it's situ um, we're not situated in the US-Mexico border, but it's, uh, it's a place that involves a lot of, of relations, transborder and transnational relationships because of the military um, established in this, in this place and the development of cybersecurity that it's also being pushed in this area, which it's um, was something so important to consider when designing these courses. In fall of 2022, this course was offered in the Spanish department, as I, uh, as I mentioned, and it was designed 
um, as a course that was mostly teaching literature about, about border women to analyze different historical, um, geographical, and thematic situations using digital technologies. We engage mostly in data from the humanities with literature um, to create different visualizations such as timelines, maps, and, and graphics. The course was centered mostly in the US-Mexico border. Um, and with, with the grant that we received, the redesign of this course together with Paulina Hernandez Trejo, who recently graduated from the English department, had a shift in the redesign of the uh, of the course and we focus mostly in gender violence and feminicides using different sources not just literature to analyze this um, topic so we started working with some literature with some archival material with some of the databases that were created by the mothers and activists that have been engaged in this movement um, since, the, since the early 90s, as well as data from social media and public and, and in public spaces that have really uh, pushed for different public policy. And, and there has been several digital projects that are also working with different organizations and the collection of data and remediating the violence that exists in, in the processes to compile the data about feminicides and gender violence in this region. So with that, um, the grant was um, designed mostly to explore uh, different literary texts, archival material, databases, mostly of counter data that were created um, with the mothers since the pre-digital age. Some digital projects that address gender violence and related violence and feminicides in the US-Mexico border and moving to an inter international and global scope, such as um, projects like Anita Luches's project, or other projects that are um, working along Latin America specifically. The engagement of this of these different sources that carries on um, humanities and activist data was to really understand um, how this data is being produced, who is compiling this data, what is missing, why is there's some data missing. And why is this data is not um, engaging in dialogues of public policy? And our, our responsibility as humanists to also learn different technologies to create ethical and responsible and responsible data sets and visualizations. The core this course was offered for um, honors college students from the English department and from the Spanish department. Some of the students were um, in the data in, in data science and history in literature. And in um, I think it was um, in geography. So we and, and political science. So we, we have different perspectives of how each student was analyzing and approaching this, the data and the topics. And um, it was their first time using different technologies and digital literacy, um, being exposed to that. So we tried to start creating tutorials and activities for them to introduce them to these topics, but to really understand um, the understanding of a transporter approach to this data. A lot of this data was... Um, was gathered in the pre-digital age. So as you can see in here, um, the data was coming from these flyers that the mothers and the activists will paste throughout the streets. There's um, La, Cru La Cruz de Clavos, this um, cross, it's um, in the US-Mexico border in Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, once you cross to El Paso, which carries on different little papers of um, the names of the missing women and um, asking also for justice um, at different at different levels. 
We see a lot of flyers that carry on, on a lot of this data that um, are reposited in the mother's houses, are reposited in the organizations that I have kept um, are doing these efforts. And then we see another kind of data, which is the data that it's localized in social media, having the threat of being disappeared, um, uncontextualize a lot of this data, and really thinking about how can we intervene to identify this data, to visualize it and, and contextualize it um, as to what it means um, for further research or for further um, change. We engage in different models. Um, so as you can see here, there were some models um, of understanding bilingual uh, transporter poems um, that speak about this um, different cases and situations um, written and performed by by women writers that have been engaged in this activism or that ha have consulted the archives and the stories about these women to create this literature. So we started engaging in text analysis to really understand the particular sentiment that this um, literature carries on. Another example was model three, which was um, approaching to cartographies and really thinking about the act of um, terrorism as data, what it means to create maps about gender violence and feminicides and for who uh, are these maps? Are we perpetuating a violence that will affect the families and the women that are being represented or are we creating cartographies that will really help um, the and support the mothers that are looking for for their girl um, sisters or daughters um, or for for policy change. So we engage in different um, cartography approaches using open source tools to think about geographical approaches to it. And we really also were inspired about many activists and scholars that have been engaged in, in feminist cartographies um, in this matter. We also um, do some analysis, text mining, with several of the archival material that has been collected specifically about newspapers that are in the university, um, New Mexico State University that hold a big collection of newspapers um, about the feminicides and gender violence in Ciudad Juarez that was gathered by Esther Chavezcano, an activist that started since the 90s compiling these newspapers. These newspapers are in PDF files, mostly are in Spanish. So that was also, also another engagement of how students started seeing that this data requires sometimes translations or collaborations to understand um, what it's being hold. There was also um, map, a map and a database that was created in analog format that it's located in um, books. So it require um, the digitalization of this data set and, and understand what it means digitizing this material, which there was um, some observations that, that um, we had to consider. Lastly, there was um, some engagements in, in digital activism in social media to create data networks that will visualize the long trajectory of um, hashtags. Um, moving forward, this was, this is some of the literature that was being used um, from an interdisciplinary approach and from a also transborder approach of publications that were done on both sides of the border. Um, such as El Silencio Que La Voz De Todas Quiebra, which holds this first database and map. Um, in, in that book, there's um, very few versions of it um, now, um, which also require for us to, to make some copies to have access to it. Um, understanding the, the long trajectory of activism and the feminicides in the US-Mexico border through terrorizing women, and more recently, uh, work that it's really engaging in data science, such as counting feminicides or um, the handbook on feminicides and femicides that engages in the creation of some of these 
digital projects and, and the data that has been compiled by activists. And in the middle section, we had several of the humanities research that has been done or the production of literary texts such as Sangre en el Desierto that was produced by Alicia Gaspar de Alba, um, mentioning particular cases that were that happened in the 90s or Señorita Extravia that also show us the landscape and the geographies of, of this situation and some of the murals and artistic representations that also holds this humanities data to understand um, this particular case. In the, in the latter part, we see some of the digital projects that show us different approaches and, and different objectives of, of compiling this data and making it publicly for different reasons, such as Echos, um, Ellas Tienen nombre, nombre, which is a cartography mapping feminicides from Ciudad Juarez, missing the data from the US side, for instance. Um, Huellas Incomodas, it's compiling um, graffitis and public, um, public feminist expressions that holds also some data mentioning some of the names of the aggressors of the missing women. And lastly, Sovereign Bodies Institution, which also um, depths in into the, the data of indigenous women in the US-Canada border region. Two of the models that I would like to, to discuss just briefly, specifically because Kiri and Nilu will talk about the research that the research they took after, after this class. It's uh, model number four, transnational public and digital activism against gender violence and feminicides. And this particular model was to trace, to learn how to trace the different um, digital activism happening in, in social media of different feminist activists that are mobilizing through social media to, to push for public policy or um, to spread the word about the missing, the missing women, the feminicides that are happening, or the policies that should change to mobilize in a, in a local and a global matter. So students went through and started localizing different hashtags about gender violence and feminicides um, from around the world. We see here from one of the students, Lila Smith, that specifically went to understand the gender violence and feminicides in, in Asian countries, um, as well as in Latin America, such as Ni Una Menos, and trace what was the meaning of it and how it evolved throughout time. They were engaged um, in analyzing the different the different hashtags, who were who was using it, who were reposting them. But then they engage in learning um, how to do data networks and visualize this this um, data to contextualize it and show uh, and show the different networks of how this data is spreading in the digital spaces. Another example, it's model five, which is decolonizing practices, identifying and visualizing contextualized counter data. And this started with a project um, of mapping themselves. Um, it was mapping and thinking about the places that students feel secure, that students feel uncomfortable um, about their identity, about what it means different places for different people, um, depending on intersectionality. This map could be drawn, could be greeted, or could be used different digital tools. But then it was connected to the final, um, one of the final projects where they engage in a digital map, um, carrying on the different skills and the different thematics that they learned throughout the semester to compile some of the data about feminicides and gender violence. It could be from the US-Mexico border or from somewhere else and create um, these feminist cartographies. As you can see here, 
Um, we engage with Google My Maps, with Story Maps, um, but they were also, they learn about geographical feminist data and how it looks like to what kind of data they should include, what kind of data should be uh, not made public specifically about these um, topics. Lastly, um, I will like to to mention some of the main observations um, from this class that require further work. Um, it's the aspect of transnational, transborder, and translocal feminist data analysis. When speaking about this kind of data, there is um, data that it's reposited and that it's produced from a local perspective that it's completely different to understanding it from a transnational um, approach. There is the situation about pre-digital age analog and digital feminist data methodologies. A lot of the feminists in the 90s were collecting this data by phone, by person that hold all this in analog formats, which is completely different to the forms that data it's being collected in the present times. So there should be some further conversations to, to put this together in order not to to miss the, the past efforts of, of data collection in this matter. Translate translingual and multilingual data integration, it's required. Um, a lot of the data from the US-Mexico border gender violence and feminicides cases, it's in Spanish, but it circulated a lot in English. So there's also a lot of importance to integrate um, the data, the data sets and the sources that come from both sides. That was something that I observed. There were some students um, not comfortable about reading newspapers or data sets in Spanish. Um, that was for them more work and they wanted um, me to translate that work beforehand. Um, but I think this is part of um, the objectives of really engaging in in this, um, in this work from a humanities lens. Another aspect is the feminist global digital literacy and skills documentations. From the humanities sides, there's a need to really um, push for further digital literacies and skills um, when approaching gender violence and feminicides, um, either from literature, archival material, or history and social science. And um, the global humanities data intergenerational knowledge interactions, it's also connected with this pre-digital age analog data, which is the practices that many of the mothers and activists have been carrying on since, um, since early days in the 90s where they will use other methodologies to compile this data, to contextualize it, and to preserve it differently from what, how, how it's happening in the present. So that was something of the main um, ob objectives of this class to put together these different parts that have been separated and to further this research from a local to a global perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just like we can go to the next speaker, Lofer, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fernandez, and thank you everyone for uh, attending our presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. So I'm going to talk about digital activism and cultural manifestations in the aftermath of women life freedom movement. 
Um, the death of Masa Amini in September 2022 uh, sparked widespread protests in Iran and ignited a powerful movement demanding women's rights and freedom. Uh, in the face of an authoritarian government that strictly controls decent, um, Iranian activists uh, decided to turn to digital activism as their primary mode of resistance. And they use social uh, media platforms like Instagram and Twitter, uh, which enable the voices of these activists to spread rapidly uh, either within Iran and to Iranian diaspora communities. This digital activism has profoundly influenced cultural productions, including literature, cinema, and art. So you know, to visualize the key components of this digital activism, I have created a graph uh, with four main nodes. Uh, uh, Masa Amini hashtag, uh, which is depicted with color turquoise, and Women Life Freedom hashtag with the same color, My Stealthy Freedom Movement, uh, which is uh, depicted with navy blue, and One Million Signatures campaign, which is depicted with yellow. So uh, the Masa Amini and Women Life Freedom hashtags represent the online activism that erupted after Amini's death. And My Stealthy Freedom is an ongoing movement uh, protesting Iran's compulsory hijab laws. And the One Million Signatures campaign aimed to collect signatures to repeal discriminatory laws against women in Iran. So these nodes uh, capture the multifaceted nature of, of Iranian women's digital activism in the recent years. Uh, to talk about transnational advocacy in the first, I should say that the power of digital activism uh, lies in its ability to rapidly disseminate information and unite people across borders uh, in pursuit of a common cause. According to Kick and Sicking, voices that are suppressed in their own societies may find that networks can project and amplify their concerns into an international arena which in turn can echo back into their own countries transnational networks multiply the voices that are heard in international and domestic policies so um, I gathered the data for this uh, project through social media platforms such as uh, X and Instagram and uh, it is important to note that uh, a significant portion of this information is in Farsi, which is the native language of Iran, rather than English. And this uh, presents the unique challenges of data analysis and highlights the need for language diversity in digital activism research. Uh, furthermore, activists within Iran face limited access to social media platforms due to some government restrictions and censorship. So Iranian activists in the diaspora and transnational supporters played a crucial role in amplifying the voices of those on the ground uh, by spreading information and helping to develop the women life freedom movement. Um, these two hashtags, Masa Amini and Women Life Freedom, uh, exemplify how online activism can overcome the deliberate suppression of information that sustains many abuses of power and help reframe international and domestic debates. So by sharing news, images, and personal stories on social media, Iranian activists made the world aware of uh, Amini's death and the broader struggle for women's rights, applying international pressure on the Iranian government. So this widespread use of these hashtags illustrates the advocacy networks uh, that are significant transnationally and domestically by building new links among actors in civil societies, states, and international organizations. Um, so um, here you can see um, Women Life Freedom hashtag node and um, all the uh, related um, nodes. And I have used the color orange to um, depict uh, people uh, and activists and also a dark green notes for depicting uh, websites. So one of the people who stood in solidarity 
uh, with a women life freedom movement uh, was Alicia uh, Alicia Garza, who is a prominent social activist and one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And she used her um, Instagram account, shared information about Massa's case, and collected and called on her followers to speak out against uh, police brutality and state violence in Iran. Um, so uh, while social media activism can rapidly raise awareness, data activism involves deeper work of systematically collecting, analyzing, and visualizing information to expose injustice and advocate for change. And the One Million Signatures campaign embodies this data activist approach in the context of Iranian women's rights. Um, data activism often emerges in response to missing data, uh, that is, um, the state and its institutions systematically ignore the phenomenon, neglect uh, to count and register cases, and often neglect to conceptualize gender-related violence in such a way that it could even be counted precisely. The One Million Signature campaign in Iran aimed to fill this data gap by collecting tangible evidence of support for repealing discriminatory laws. Uh, here you can see the main node of this campaign and all the uh, connected factors here, people, uh, awards, websites, and um, we all know that data activism is emotionally taxing, especially when uh, documenting gender-based violence and oppression. Recording and caring for feminicide data is a heavy work, and activist self-care is crucial to avoid burnout. So this is where uh, the make labor visible principle of data feminism comes into play. And another key principle is elevate emotion and embodiment. Uh, we have to recognize that data is not just abstract numbers, but represents lived experiences. So there is an added value to our insistence on producing individualized stories of feminicide in contrast to anonymous numbers usually provided by governments and international organizations. So the One Million Signatures campaign try to humanize discriminatory laws by highlighting the stories of individual women impacted by such laws. And in the fast paced and ever changing landscape of social media, it is crucial for us um, as researchers to prioritize the storage of data in stable data sets and files because information shared on platforms like Instagram and X is vulnerable to being deleted um, or lost during platform updates. And this labor intensive process of data collection and maintenance aligns with make the way, uh, labor visible principle of data feminism that recognizes and values um, the time, effort, and emotional toll involved in documenting, safeguarding, this information. And in this way, we can better appreciate the dedication and resilience of those who are engaged in digital activism for women's rights in Iran and beyond. Here, you can see um, the information related to one of the activists of One Million Signatures campaign, Kronak Safarzadeh, age 21. Um, she is an Iranian women's rights activist. And she campaigned for women's rights by collecting signatures for the One Million Signature Campaign. And she was arrested on November 4th, uh, 2007, the day after she participated in Children's Day celebration in which she collected signatures for the campaign. Um, the impact of uh, Iranian women's digital activism extends beyond online spheres into cultural productions like literature, cinema, and art. And these works can explore um, the subaltern counter publics that emerge from experiences of marginalization. Nancy Fraser defines um, subaltern um, counter publics as parallel discursive arenas where members of subordinated social groups invent and circulate counter discourses which in turn permit them to formulate oppositional interpretations of their identities, interests, and needs. 
Similarly, Iranian activists use visual media online to circumvent censorship. Um, uh, for example, the My uh, Still Fee Freedom Movement invites women to share photos of themselves without a job. Uh, it is a simple yet powerful act of defiance against compulsory dress codes. And uh, the movement's founder, Masih Ali Najad, explains that these images serve to challenge the Iranian government's narrative that women are happy to wear mandatory head covering and reveal the real stories of Iranian women and their desires. Literary and artistic representations of digital activism are also emerging. A good example is uh, the song Baroya by Shervin Hajipur, which was considered the uh, official anthem of uh, Women Life Freedom Movement. And uh, he won the uh, Grammy Award for Best Song for Social Change uh, with this song. So uh, the Women Life Freedom Movement shed light on various forms of violence faced by women in Iran, including physical, psychological, and cultural violence. And in documenting and analyzing these multiple dimensions of um, a violence, I drew inspiration from the model of coding feminicide data developed in the context of US-Mexico borderlands because this approach emphasizes the importance of capturing the nuances and complexities of gender-based violence and recognizing that it intersects with other systems of oppression such as racism, classicism, and xenophobia. Um, so the compulsory hijab law, for example, is not only a violation of women's bodily autonomy, but it is a symbolic tool of subjugation that perpetuates harmful gender stereotypes. And one of the challenges um, of um, data activism, despite the immense promise of digital activism, it faces challenges and limitations. Uh, and one ever present risk is government retaliation against activists. And uh, another one is that activists must balance their own well being with the emotional toll of the work, because working with feminicide data represents a particular tension between maintaining enough distance to emotionally handle the work while also getting close enough to connect with the victims to recognize their journeys. And there are also technical challenges. Uh, feminicide data are often incomplete for individual level characteristics like age, sex, gender, relationship, because those who re record and report publicly available data often uh, miss basic facts. So underreporting and data gaps can limit the ability to apply an intersectional lens. And, uh, digital activism is unavoidably shaped by the design and policies, uh, policies of tech flag platforms. For example, my research is dependent on graph comments. So I should back up my data through keeping a data set. And we should uh, remain mindful of the dual potential of data. Data can be a powerful tool for understanding ex and exposing the realities of gender-based violence, but it can also be used to manipulate perceptions and reinforce harmful narratives. So as researchers, we have a responsibility to document and present data in a way that accurately captures the experiences of those affected by violence and resist a misinterpretation, misrepresentation, or exploitation. So it requires a commitment to ethical and participatory research practices that center the voices and needs of marginalized communities. And Iranian women's digital activism illustrates the potential for digital activism to transcend borders and spark cultural transformation in the face of even the most repressive regimes and their resistance remind us that even when public space is constricted, there is subversive power in claiming cyberspace, physical space, and cultural space. 
and mapping the data from the Women Life Freedom Movement visually demonstrates the transnational connectivity that is central to my argument. And by visualizing the networks of information sharing and solidarity building that span across borders, I can effectively illustrate the global impact of the movement. And this visualization serves as an evidence to support my claim that the success of this movement is rooted in its ability to forge connections and mobilize support beyond Iran's borders. And uh, as I continue to develop this project, uh, it is important to know that it will ultimately form a chapter of my dissertation. And uh, this is still a work in progress and I am committed to refining and strengthening my arguments. Um, so I welcome any feedback, critiques, or suggestions that can help improve the quality of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful paper again. And uh, now, just Kitty, if you want to. Thank you. everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> I want to thank Professor Fernandez for in inviting me to join this panel and for introducing me to my new obsession, which is digital mapping and feminist cartography. So thank you. I begin with a poem, Yo Soy Joaquin by Ro Rodolfo Corqui Gonzalez to mark the emergence of a transtemporal transnational movimiento. Gonzalez's work launched alongside the Chicano movement underscores naming oneself as a resistant response to the process of assimilation, as assimilation is not a natural or passive operation, but rather a violent act imperialism enforces upon the subject. Yosoy speaks to this oppositional identity to Americanization that declaring oneself Chicano enacted in the late 1960s. In addition, we see Gonzalez mapping himself and mapping Chicano identity within the ethnic Mexican experience in the US. Gonzalez pulls on varied identity labels, including la raza, Mexicano, Espanol, Latino, Chicano, and then follows these multiple, perhaps overlapping yet distinct identities with the line or whatever I call myself. These strategies of naming the self distinguish differences in names and in doing so does two things. One, he releases any permanent ties to these labels as he states, or whatever I call myself. And two, he reinscribes himself within and across the labels as he continues, I look the same, I feel the same, I cry and sing the same. This disorients and reorients the reader to the fluid, porous and evolving nature of names, labels and identities we encounter another moment of outright resistance to assimilative US force as Gonzalez asserts, I refuse to be absorbed. As he maps himself, his communities and his history poetically, the text becomes a decolonial anti-assimilate strategy to be leveraged by ethnic Mexicans, Mexican Americans, Chicanexes, and more. Notions and questions of unbelonging are felt most pressingly through Gonzalez's opening lines. There's a statement of disorientation of the choque that Gloria Saldua discusses when more than one culture collides and we question what we know, who we are and how we unbelong to seemingly oppositional cultures or worlds. While the name Chicano began as a way to claim one's space, speak back to empire and embrace the in-betweenness and disorientation of being Mexican American, it also at times evolved into an exclusionary formation privileging patriarchy and heteronormativity. Miroslava Chavez Garcia's genealogical tracing of Chicana history, movements, and studies, in contrast, illustrates these exclusionary practices within the Chicano community as monolithic thinking shaped its development, with little attention to internal stratification and how women's issues were and are absented through cultural nationalism. In a study by Pesquera and Segura highlighted in her scholarship, they concluded that Chicanas and Latinas were less concerned with finding ways to incorporate women in male dominated society and express more interest in developing ways to alter systems of inequality and exploitation engendered by capitalism vis-a-vis -vis their white counterparts. 
This response to not belonging or belonging yet trying to find a liberated position beside the American mainstream or Chicano patriarchy encapsulates many developments that shape the Chicano movement and its evolution. Assimilation and unbelonging raise important yet vexing questions. Belonging at what cost? Belonging to what? In what ways does assimilation ask one to negotiate the need to belong or the fear of not belonging? What does belonging feel like, look like, and act like? Chicana feminists have articulated feminist research methodologies and argue that new knowledge is uncovered by looking in liminal spaces and interstitial gaps for the unheard, the unthought, the unspoken. By mapping the interstitial embodied art and artistic expressions of the long Chicano movement, I play with its temporal spatial boundaries and tensions as it interrogates the assimilative process. I question how creative acts interpret the history and after effects of the Chicano movement across generations and geographies. As I open with the poem, I am Joaquin, I further trace the creative work of the Chicano movement through contemporary dance artists with lineages in the US-Mexico Bracero program to lay bare such accounts of absent to Latinx histories, particularly in the area of dance performance. Glor Gloria Ansaldua's seminal work, Borderlands, La Frontera, The New Mestiza, remaps our understanding of what a border is, presenting it not as a simple divide between here and there, us and them, but as a psychic, social, and cultural terrain that we inhabit and that inhabits all of us. C. Alejandra Elenes has furthered this borderlands work and notes that, quote, in its metaphorical sense, the border refers to the symbolic barriers that divide communities along race, class, gender, and sexual orientation lines, academic disciplines, and organizational structures. Lorgia Garcia Peña's integration of El Nie, a symbolic space of neither here nor there, further challenges border conceptualizations as it, quote, displaces the location and polarity of the nation border, instead of proposing the body as the location that contains and reflects national exclusion borders across history and generations, end quote. What does the notion of El Nie mean for Gloria Saldua's geographies of self and Américo Paredes' conceptualization of greater Mexico? How do bodies speak to borders? How might a dancing body act as an agent further extending the physical, metaphorical, and symbolic borders of nation states, their subsequent entangled ideologies, and their dancing citizens? How do Chicana dance artists become such agents, negotiating and potentially extending the very temporal spatial borders of the Chicano movement? How does the border reside within and divide across a singular body and its diasporas? To consider these questions, I look at two contemporary Chicana dance artists and their transnational family dance lineages across the visual spatial temporal boundaries of Zacatecas in Mexico and Washington, California and Texas in the United States between 1942 and 2022. These diasporic artists who have continuously presented their own hybrid driven choreographic work in the United States and Mexico have recently created dances that respond to their family's lived experiences in the Bracero program. This temporary worker program allowed Mexican laborers to work in the United States during World War II and beyond. It was intended to address the US wartime labor shortage and ended up providing employment for Mexican workers. The program was controversial, however, with many critics arguing that while stabilizing the US agrarian economy through and after the war, it exploited Mexican workers and contributed to the mistreatment and abuse of migrant laborers. The Bracero program significantly impacted the participants and their families and the relationship between the US and Mexico. What follows is the artist's choreography shaped by their familial and cultural dance experiences that traveled across multiple borders through generations, spans of time and geographies. Their choreographies, homages to the sacrifices of love and labor their families poured into the Bracero program, stand as diasporic iterations of their past, present and future. Their counter assimilate strategy through creative practice resonates with Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez's poem, I am Joaquin through transborder feminista dance making. 
and I need to click on this map. Do you all see a map on my page now? Yes, okay, great. Elisa de la Rosa hails from the U.S.-Mexico borderlands of the Rio Grande Valley, Texas, and Nuevo Progreso, Tamaulipas, an area steeped in rich cultural heritage and tradition. Currently residing in Denton, Texas, three hours north of her beloved hometown, Elisa has deep ancestral roots in central Mexico's Rio Grande and Zacatecas regions. Through the Bracero program, her family migrated to Washington State in the US, where they would move back and forth depending on the harvesting season between Washington and Texas. Ultimately, their journey led them to settle in Donna, Texas. De La Rosa's work, which she created during her graduate studies in New Jersey, in Montclair, New Jersey, focuses on the recovery, reclamation, and sharing of Tejana identities. Her rehearsal pedagogy creates a healing space for the community, including student performers and audience members to draw on their own identities in relation to Tejanidad. Her aim is to empower individuals to feel a sense of ownership and agency over their identities. De La Rosa created Tortillas y Lagrimas, or Tortillas and Tears, in 2018. Her immigrante or immigrant, as part of this more extensive work, relies on the memories of her abuela, of her grandmother. It was her story that enabled me to create the work, ref reflects De La Rosa. As her abuela recounts her experience crossing the border with her husband and three small children, traveling from Rio Grande, Zacatecas in Mexico to the US, a film scans still images of crossings by foot of that very borderline. In a stunning display of performance art, De La Rosa boldly submerges her entire body onto the screen, fearlessly placing herself on stage and captivating the audience with her mesmerizing presence. Donning a Mexican sarape and balancing two jugs of water, she sloshes around a bit incoherent, discombobulated, perhaps even lost. The images run across her body, inscribing the DNA of her ancestors. Her abuela's voice continues softly, we listen, we wonder, what does this story mean to De La Rosa as a granddaughter, performing artist, and choreographer? What follows is a reflection from De La Rosa on the process of creating such a personal work and what new insight she's been left with after going through the process. My grandmother worked hard to provide for her family and built her grounding as a Mexican immigrant. In our interview, she talks about living under a tree for three months until they were eight housing. My family then migrated to Washington State to begin working in the fields. It became a family tradition to migrate from the Rio Grande Valley to the Northwest with all of their children picking crops and vegetation. My goal with this work was to share a glimpse of the sacrifice that Mexican immigrants make in pursuit of a better life for their families. What I realize now is that the sacrifice and incredible work ethic does not stop after immigrating to the US. It's a continuum that lives in our own families. These family migration narratives were embedded in the conversations at the Cocina de Mi Abuelita at my grandmother's kitchen table. They were a reminder that nothing was impossible and that with hard work, we could accomplish anything. The multiple pieces of family oral history, movements draped in symbolic costuming and props, and documentary film bites flashing across the screen and catching the dancing body exude the intricate overlapping patterns of a kaleidoscope and other times break apart as a piñata splits and spills. Picked at random in no particular linear order, the fragmented threads and disjointed separations feel like snapshots into De La Rosa's storied world channeled through her abuela's memory. And the last mapping I have is Elisa today who continues to go back. Now she goes back to Mexico City to study and reconnect to her family roots. Now I'm gonna share a second map. And I just wanna confirm, can everybody see this new map on my screen? Yes, okay, great. Francesca Marisol Cabrera, 
has extensive family ties to Oxnard, California, a well-known agricultural community in the South Central region of California. She grew up in Goleta, California, approximately two hours north. Her maternal ancestry is rooted in Colombia, while her paternal lineage originates from Zacatecas, Mexico. Her father's family relocated to Texas through the Bracero program and eventually settled in Oxnard, California. Cabrera's creative practice stems from intersecting dance genres. She also created the work that I am analyzing while she was on the East Coast in New York City. Her film, Caminante Danzante, or Walking Dancer, is an autoethnographic ode to the labor, love, and sacrifice of her grandfather and the rich dance tradition, the Danza Guadalupana. He started for his family in Mexico and continued in the US. The film begins with her own inquiry, wondering, have you ever asked if your ancestors were dancers? She had not, and she was not prepared to realize she had a generations of dancers in her family. She pays tribute to the rich cultural tradition of this intergenerational dance practice through her work. She adeptly intertwines the oral histories, videos, and photographs of over a dozen family members spanning three generations to create a compelling narrative. Through her own personal reflections, she skillfully narrates the story of what this dance practice has meant to her and her family. Before leaving her autoethnographic and documentarian perspective, she inserts her body in the frame, which we saw in the previous mapping. She makes a path for her story to be heard and seen. Her red lace hiking boots and the gestural punctuations of her hands perform the labor of her ancestors. Cabrera believes that working on this project has allowed her to step back in time through the stories of her family and imagine what life was like for them back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. As she ponders her lifelong attraction towards the natural world, she contemplates if it is somehow linked to her family's profound legacy of nurturing the planet's resources through harvesting. She considers her dance film an attempt at honoring her family's dance lineage, their devotion to La Virgen de Guadalupe and La Fe Católica, the community danza has created, and her own embodied movement and stories. While the Bracero program mobilized the De La Rosa and Cabrera families, dance followed their migrations. Formative dance histories of their childhood and families are passed down through recounting from their families and referencing these experiences in their choreographic works. Their creative practice and embodied performances continually question, reclaim, and interpret the findings of their selves, their ancestors, and their parts of history. Their works shift and break as the kaleidoscope and piñata to hold simultaneous histories of their families and now their own within their performances. Notions of physical, metaphorical, and symbolic borders are complicated through their own artistic response to such experiences they have lived with and through their families. As the border has transformed these families and runs through the stories of multiple generations, the dancing families have metamorphosized the boundary lines anew. Thank you.